Hello, everyone, and welcome to our weekly Power Lounge. This is your place to hear authentic conversations from women in digital who have power to share. My name is Amy Vaughn, and I am the owner and chief empowerment officer of Together Digital, a diverse and collaborative community of women who work in digital marketing and advertising and choose to share their knowledge, power, and connections. You can learn more about us at www.togetherindigital.com. And today, we're going to learn more about how to take the sleaze out of email marketing. We know we've gotten those in our inbox, right? <laughs> Maybe we've written some of those emails. It's okay. No shame here. We're going to cover the three main pillars of ethical marketing and how you can implement those in your emails. We will also help you understand emails, better practices, and how to implement them into your business. Uh, we're also going to talk about, and with our guest, how a journalism job at 17 at a national radio station led her to become the business owner who does ethical marketing. And the woman that is here to help empower us today in our power lounge is Yaval Ackerman. She is a person you want to work with when you want to promote your brand without all the possible sleaze sales, sleazy sales tactics and email marketing in the email marketing realm but do not know how to do it yourself. As an ethical email strategist and copywriter, she helps entrepreneurs and their companies tell stories and sell without feeling guilty because there is such a thing and maybe you'll have some fun along the way. She believes that email is a wonderful platform to create real and honest connections with your audience while cutting the unreliable middleman of social media out. When she's not thinking about witty and ethical ways to help her clients market themselves, you all enjoys anything food-related, songwriting, and hosts a conscious relationship podcast named Loving Against My Instincts, which I feel like we all should check out because that sounds absolutely fascinating. You've already like sucked us in with your non-sleazy marketing, you all. <laughs> Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you, Amy. Thank you everyone for logging in and joining us. Yeah, I'm excited to dig in to this topic, and I'm so glad you're here with us today. By the way, I should say all the way from Germany, which is really awesome. Yeah. I wish we could all just like somehow um, teleport into into your space into, from Berlin. So yes, uh, so cool, so cool. I'd love for you to share more about your career path, your journey up to this point and whatnot with our listener. And I want to dig in a little bit more about that journalism job at 17 that got you kind of into this space of ethical marketing. Mm. It's quite an interesting story. And thank you for, for your wonderful introduction and for asking me uh, this question. I, I, I always start by saying that I was born a storyteller and I would probably die a storyteller. The only question was how do I bring those skills that I was born with to a larger audience? And how do I help impact other people, other businesses to spread their values and, and let them shine at their best? So I was born and raised in Israel. That's where I'm from originally. And when you finish high school, that's the law. You have to enroll to the army. That's still the law. Boys, mm -hmm. girls alike, it's ridiculous. Yeah. Don't ask me how that still happens. Mm -hmm. Anyhow, what you probably don't know is that the, the army owns um, a civilian radio station huh. uh, that has about 50% reach daily. Mm -hmm. um, and then by the end of 17, I wasn't even 18. I finished high school. A week later, I was already enrolled into the station. I started basic training, doing this whole shenanigans. Um, and I was a journalist after, after a couple of months mm. and I've done that for three years. So it's not a, a matter of a couple of months, it's three right. years where you learn and grow. And I had amazing opportunities to get into all kinds of, uh, ministries and talk with really important people in high positions mm -hmm. and, um, I brought a lot of really interesting stories, mm. but at the same time, throughout those three years, besides the fact that I was probably not sleeping for three years straight, right. which was really tough, um, I always felt in my guts that something is not right. Mm. And I'm the kind of person who's really intuitive and really in touch with her body 
yeah. and um, her guts as well. Good for you. And I just understood that I cannot do journalism. Mm-hmm. Not like that. Maybe not ever again. Um, <laughs> I was convinced that I'm a storyteller and I will do that in some kind of way in the future, right. but I cannot be a journalist anymore. So those were my two big like aha moments, stepping out of um, the army and um, finishing that role. Mm-hmm. And then I just had a massive writing hiatus. I wasn't writing professionally for anyone for seven years. Mm-hmm. Because I carried with me a lot of unresolved trauma that I couldn't put my finger on. Yeah. And in between, I moved countries. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. I did a whole uh, bachelor's in sound engineering. Huh. Um, yeah. I did a couple of other things uh, like working in restaurants and, and bars and cafes. So I had all of this background in gastronomy and service and hospitality. And then something, after seven years, something began, I don't know, fizzling, bubbling inside of me. And I felt I have to tell stories again. Mm -hmm. As much as I love food, as much as I love being around food and around people, I have to tell stories again. I have to change something. And then slowly but surely, I opened my, my business and... As, as you all know, it's a, it's a process to figure out what you prefer, what is not for you. Uh, I actually started with content writing because I thought, well, if I want to tell stories, then content writing, right? Um, but then slowly but surely, my clients and I kind of believe that also the world kind of nudged me into the direction of copywriting, then more specifically email copywriting. And then there was another layer of the, the ethical email copywriting which then came into play when I finally went to therapy Mm. and resolved all of those unresolved (laughs) issues that I carried with me for such a long time. And I understood that if I do anything marketing related, Mm -hmm. if I help other people Mm -hmm. tell their stories, it has to come from a place of connect and it has to come from a place of really wanting to help other people and not really treating them as walking wallets, if that makes sense. Yes. Um, So that was, long story short, this is my journey. And um, yeah, just very, very happy and feeling very lucky to to be here and to help as many people now and hopefully also in the future. I love that. Such a powerful story. Thank you so much for sharing it. Um, so many good things in there, you know, absolutely trusting your gut and your intuition. That's something I think, especially us women have a really difficult time with doing, um, especially when it comes to what direction our life career are heading in. And I just love that you like had this whole exploratory seven years where you just went out into the world and you tried things until you kind of had that knowing again, and then acted on it. That's super powerful. So, and also yay for therapy. So thank you for being open and honest about that. I don't know how many of us haven't now been in therapy (laughs) after some point in our lives, Um, but always a huge advocate of it. And I think that's brilliant that it's what kind of brought you full circle. Um, Like a lot of times that healing is kind of coming back to those wounds and knowing how you were wounded and then how you Mm -hmm. can leverage that knowing to help others. So when it comes to ethical marketing, I'm just kind of curious, you know, as you were exploring this and as the notion and idea was starting to come to mind, how, how did you come to define what ethical marketing is? I think it was really much easier to understand first what I don't want to do or what I don't resonate with. Yeah. Um, and then through that kind of, through that negation, really find what feels right. Mm. So in the marketing room, especially in the email room, we still see a lot of tactics that are um, related to fakeness. I'm talking about fake scarcity and um, yeah. fake urgency. Mm-hmm. We see that a lot in the e-com spaces, unfortunately, but not only. Um, we also see a little bit of detachment from the brand owner or owners from Mm -hmm. their audiences Mm -hmm. and I feel like regardless of the size of your company 
if you choose to go ahead and actually start and nurture and maintain an email list, mm -hmm. you have to stay in touch with your subscribers in a way that is not patronizing. Mm -hmm. And I feel like a lot of the times or up until fairly recently, a lot of the email marketing uh, materials that I've seen around were very patronizing. Mm -hmm. A lot of that also uh, has to do with FOMO or guilt or shame, um, things that yet again, um, emails that treat subscribers as a walking wallet and not as a human being, um, mm -hmm. a lot to do with quick wins rather than nurturing a long-term relationship, which is what email is all about. Mm -hmm. um, so through that, basically, you can pretty yeah. much tell what is ethical. Um, it's about nurturing a relationship, mm -hmm. a one-on-one -on -one relationship, and multiply it by however many subscribers mm -hmm. you have, um, and really make it a dialogue rather mm -hmm. than a monologue um, mm -hmm. with people because it's two people at yeah. the two ends of both of the screens. Um, so that's what it's all about pretty much. That's great. That's I love that. It's a dialogue, not a monologue. I think a lot of us just don't think about it. I think we just kind of go in on autopilot and we start creating the kinds of messages that we think might sound convincing. Like you said, based on the notion of fear, scarcity, um, or even just, um, playing off of our, um, you know, uh, guilt or FOMO. I think all of those are really great. And I, I agree. They are really common, um, strategies and tactics, not just within email marketing, but within marketing in general. Um, mm -hmm. and you're correct. You're doing a big disservice to them as humans at the other end of that. So I'm going to skip ahead. Just one question. Then I'm going to come back to the, some of those practices because, you named a few, but I want to go back to them. But first I want to set up and, and share with our, help our listeners understand what, what do you see as the three core pillars of ethical marketing? Yeah. So when I, I decided to basically start this journey of what it is, uh, that I call ethical email marketing, I kind of researched it and got to the conclusion that, um, we have to talk about three aspects. We have to talk about storytelling, and then we also have to talk about consent mm -hmm. and transparency. Now, what that means to each and every business owner listening to us right now mm -hmm. is completely different. And that's fine. A part of being ethical is also acknowledging the fact that we're all different, that we all have different email lists with different subscribers, different expectations. And the fact that you're even aware of the fact that you have to be aware of those three things is already halfway to the solution, right? So storytelling, let's start with that. I'll start with a fact. Um, as human beings, studies have shown that we tend to remember stories 20 22 times better than we remember hardcore facts. So through stories, you can connect your subscribers to really small moments relatable moments from your life could be the last time that you had to call a plum plumber mm -hmm. or um i don't know um something surprising that the cashier told you in the supermarket right before you left and it's those little moments that kind of bring us together so that's storytelling consent is something that i believe that we need to um start from the very beginning with each and every new subscriber. Um, it starts with even your subscription form. Um, I live in Europe, so we have different rules pretty much, uh, but I am subscribed to a lot of um, American newsletters that don't comply with the G uh, GDPR rules. For example, the other day I got an email from a company that was affiliated with another company that I got that I registered to their webinar or mm -hmm. whatnot. And they just said in this email, oh, you know, you registered to this webinar. So our financial team decided to uh, approve that you're a kick ass and subscribe you to our list. Ugh. 
I can't remember the last time that I unsubscribed so fast. Yeah. Right. Really? Because not only you're breaking the rules, because even though you're an American company, I'm still based in Europe. Right. You're breaking the law and you're trying to be fun and nice about it. Like Mm -hmm. that doesn't gel with me whatsoever. Right. So that's consent, but consent has to be reinforced throughout Mm. the customer journey. Because for example, I don't know if you've seen that yourself, Amy, but with launches, for example, recently, I'm seeing a lot of copywriters or a lot of businesses who are using copywriters um, telling their subscribers, hey, we're about to launch this and that. Would you like to hop on the waiting list or would you like to hop on this launch? Mm -hmm. If yes, great, we'll send you emails. If not, we won't bother you with it. So Mm -hmm. that's consent. That's consent alongside the customer journey. And we have to make sure that we're catering to our our subscribers like that. Yeah. And then there's transparency. You wanted to say, sorry. No, it's great. I think you just bring up a fabulous point. Um, I don't know how many of of us who are listening reach out to, but I'm sure it's a good number of us, but do connect with, communicate with, and email people outside of the U.S. And I 100% agree with you, having lived a short time in in England and coming back, it's just the consumer protections are non-existent here in the United States. <laughs> so whenever you are looking at a global audience, you really do need to look and see what are the rules, what are the regulations, because those consumers are much more used to being protected and are much more aware of their rights. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you definitely stand the chance to have a bad consumer experience and maybe lose a customer from it. So yeah, I just thought that was a great point. And I'm so glad you brought it up. Yeah, yeah, for sure. But it's it's even beyond that. You know, I had a someone messaging me on LinkedIn recently, and uh, she said, "I have those people signing up for a consultation call with me. Can I add them to my mailing list automatically?" And I said, "Let me let me let me flip the question around. How would you feel if that happened to you?" And she said, "I would probably." I wouldn't probably mind. And I said, sure, but how about you give your subscribers, your new subscribers an option to do so? And by that, I guarantee you that she saved her ass. Yeah, yeah. Um, So that's consent. And then Mm -hmm. we have transparency. I mean, transparency, I always define it by what would you tell to someone that you just randomly set down next to on an airplane? Mm -hmm. um that's that's where the line stands pretty much for me at least Mm -hmm. I would probably I won't mind telling them about what I had for lunch but I probably wouldn't tell them something from my childhood that affected me deeply uh, unless you're my grandmother I was getting ready to say I'm like unless it's my mom she might just tell (laughs) (laughs) my grandmother is just like that or yeah um, some people some people are really comfortable with just sharing it all and it's you know to every exactly. person to themselves <laughs> yeah and I think that as long as you're setting the expectations and um as long as you're in constant touch with your subscribers about what they like and don't like right. then you can share as much or as little as you want and it mm-hmm. would be fine um what I think is really, really important in terms of transparency is explaining why are you doing certain things. Mm-hmm. Uh, for example, um, every once in a while with my list, I ask some kind of a question mm-hmm. like, oh, I'll, I'll give you an easy example. I noticed that some other newsletters have a read time suggestion um, at the top of yeah. how long it usually takes to actually read the newsletter. Mm-hmm. And I asked my subscribers, would you like to have that? Yeah. Um, and I gave them two buttons. One said, no, I, I, I could not care less or something like yeah. that. And another one said something like, oh yeah, that would be a nice feature, thanks. Mm-hmm. And by clicking on either one, basically I segmented my list a certain way that now every time that I'm sending a newsletter, those people yeah. who clicked certain buttons yeah. um, are getting what they asked for. Mm-hmm. And I said below the buttons, I'm doing that. So the next time that you receive an email from me, you will see that. Yeah. And by the way, if you don't click on any button, I'm going to set the default on 
no read time suggestion. Mm -hmm. So just so you know what I'm doing this for, why am mm -hmm. I collecting this zero party data from you? Mm -hmm. And what are the consequences of you not quote unquote cooperating with me? Yeah. So that's a part of transparency, super mm -hmm. simple. Um, we all want to know why we're being asked to do certain things. Well, and it's also like a great step in personalization because you're giving them options and preferences for what they're seeing and how they see it. And like you said, that's definitely takes it beyond a monologue and makes it a dialogue where they're actually giving you feedback and input. And so, yeah, I think that's a brilliant idea. I might be borrowing that also for our live listeners. If you haven't looked into the chat yet, we'll include it in the show notes. You can subscribe to the Yaval's email list, um, which I know I'm going to do because I'm just going to be watching it for all these great ideas and practices. <laughs> So stories, consent, transparency, let's bring it back a little bit to, again, unless there, unless there weren't any others you felt were um, that stuck out, but I was curious as to what um, other marketing practices and tactic, tactics fall short when it comes to ethical marketing. And if, and, and, and of these examples, like why, why do these become such the habits if, if we all know that they're obnoxious and I mean, relatively ineffective. So the funny thing is most of those tactics to an extent still work and that's why people are still using them. So that's one reason I'm starting from, from the second question, basically. And uh, another part of it is laziness. Just going to go ahead and say that. Um, and, and the third part of it is business owners who either don't care or don't know or are too afraid to ask somewhere in between those lines um, and they're just copying what they see that has worked for other businesses and I think that's really dangerous because what's working for your business mm -hmm. won't necessarily work for my audience mm -hmm. and vice versa now what are other tactics, um, any kind of manipulation to open emails, for example, ah, clickbait, <laughs> clickbait, or, um, do you know those emails that their subject line so starts with a re or forward? Yes. Oh my God. That's so annoying. I'm like, come on. <laughs> I can see. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. The, the peak of it to me was, uh, a welcome sequence, not even a welcome sequence, a welcome email that I got right after I subscribed to uh, like a company's email list to see what they're doing. And their first email ever started with a re <laughs> and that's, I immediately wow. unsubscribed. Yeah. I mean, that's I think key. that if you're using those tactics, you have a much deeper problem than low open rates that we can talk about later. Right. Um, you have a problem with either deliverability or even more important trust mm -hmm. if your subscribers if even your newest subscribers do not trust you houston we have a problem truly um so yeah other tactics that i'm seeing around it can be even something very very simple and this is a bit of a gray area of let's say even to to this interview to this uh, podcast recording we sent a registration link and we are only sending i mean hypothetically we are only sending the registration link and the access to people who wanted it right we don't send it to everyone not everyone wanted it so they're not getting it mm -hmm. same with the replay I still somehow could be a tech issue. I don't know. It doesn't really matter, to be honest. Right. Um, I still see companies who, you know, if you didn't show up, you didn't register, all of the above, they're still sending you every single thing. Mm -hmm. They just streamline it and decide that, you know what, they're on my list. They might as well just, we might as well just send it to them, you know, because maybe we'll get a click or maybe we'll get a sale. Mm -hmm. Um, and this is a bit of a gray area again, sure. but I think, you know, don't give people something that they didn't ask for. 
Mm-hmm. To me, that's a part of consent. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Those are fantastic examples. Um, the next question I have for you is, you know, you're kind of preaching to the choir here, probably most likely with the question. <laughs> because we all um, are here because we understand and believe in the value of marketing. But for those who are listening who are just maybe on the fence about this email thing, (laughs) why is email marketing such an instrumental piece to any business? Just even backing it up from ethical marketing for a minute. I can approach this question from several places, I would say, or different paths. If you're looking at the facts, email marketing is still the most profitable marketing channels out there. We're talking about an ROI of 36 up until the 42, 44 dollars per every dollar that you're spending. I don't know any other marketing channels that can offer you such a thing. Obviously, it's not a guarantee, but that's the statistics. Another thing that we need to consider is the fact that email marketing is a conversation. It is a dialogue. Mm -hmm. So as one, you own the platform. And because you own the platform, you don't have to rely on the middlemen of social media. Mm -hmm. Um, I can give you an example of a friend of mine, a local business owner here in Berlin. She, um, her Instagram got hacked just a couple of weeks ago. Luckily for her, she has an email list. Had she not had an email list, she would have lost all of her, let's call it fan base. Yeah, connections, yeah. In a second, she cannot log in. Mm -hmm. And as we all know, Facebook, Instagram, those things crash every once in a while. Mm -hmm. Um, So when you don't own the platform, Mm -hmm. you're in a bit of a risky situation, I would say. Mm -hmm. Um, but beyond that, I think that if you really want to nurture a connection with your subscribers, with your, with your audience, not even with your subscribers, then you have to turn your audience into subscribers because we know that the future is heavily relying on personalization. Yeah. We also know that, Ooh, I lost my train of thought right there. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> that happens um yeah it's it's just a very oh yeah I don't know about you but everyone that I'm talking with pretty much when it comes to their emails it's so personal to them mm-hmm. and when it comes to social media it's like yeah right you know it's a person shouting at whoever many people who are going to watch this later if, mm. if at all yeah. Um, but when it comes to our inboxes, that's a sacred place. Yeah. Uh, I'm still one of those people who has fun opening her letterbox, her postbox. Yeah. Even though everything that I receive is <laughs> bills. <laughs> right. <laughs> but I'm excited to see my name there, you know, on letters. Yeah. Um, so it's so personal to us. Yeah. So if you decide that email marketing is for you, you need to consider it and treat it and your subscribers Mm -hmm. as as sacredly as it feels to them yeah Um, and I said there if you choose email marketing because for some people that's not their jam Mm -hmm. and that's fine yeah if you want to invest your time energy money somewhere else I'm the last person who would tell you but no, you have to do email marketing. Yeah. If that's not for you, it's not for you. And that's okay. Mm -hmm. Um, Email needs to be sustainable as well. That's another part of um, the ethical aspect of it. Yeah. You make such an interesting point. I've never really thought about it like that with each of those channels. Um, Julie, who's always uh, behind the scenes, helping us out um, with the, the podcast and with the webinar with our live audience. Um, she was asking the live listening audience, what tactics, uh, have you seen that drive you insane? Like eight email, eight emails from the same company in one oh. day, Kristen shared unsubscribed CTA buttons that lead to an error page. Oh my God. Rude. 
Uh, and there's also like all kinds of strategies and tactics on those unsubscribe pages too, where they like try to like trick you into staying subscribed somehow. And I'm just like, but you're right. I feel like when I see marketing in social, I'm just kind of so immune and I know I can't personalize what's coming into my feed because of Facebook API, Instagram, all that stuff. But you're right. Like I control who comes into my inbox. I can unsubscribe. I can subscribe these. I'm letting these people in. So I think it's why also everybody has such a more like a personal front to bad email experiences. So I agree with you. If you're going to do it, um, you've got to do it right. And I'm so glad we're having this conversation. It's like <laughs> all time even for us because, you know, we're working through planning for together digital for the new year. And yeah, email is something I'm like, oh, we could be doing so much better. And so, yeah, just talking with you and a couple other folks yesterday, like I like, that's where my head is at right now is an email. And it's a really exciting space to really explore how to grow, not just your audience, but that relationship with your audience. So this is like so well timed. And for those of us who or those who are listening as well, um, I'm kind of curious, especially if they want to go back to their offices and start to advocate for more ethical email marketing. Not everyone here owns and runs their own business. Some of us work for companies and or agencies or organizations. Um, how can they start to talk about creating, establishing, putting into practice better email, but more ethical email practices? Um, where they might not have so much of a say in things, whereas like I'm deciding this is changing. So tomorrow it's changed. That's not everybody's <laughs> world. <basically. laughs> That's a great question. Um, I think the, the beauty of marketing, which is also something that, you know, some business owners might hate <laughs> is mm -hmm. the fact that it's heavily relying on testing. Yeah. So even if you don't have so much of a say um, at your workplace, you, I think, and, and this is coming from, I acknowledge a very, very privileged position that I'm in, um, but you can go to your boss and say, how about we test things out? It's still going to cost the same amount of money, probably, um, hopefully, and we, we're just going to test it. Mm -hmm. If your way goes Great, let's stick to that. But what if my way goes? Right. What if we see that people really, really resonate with the whole ethical thing? Right. I mean, you cannot really argue with results with data. Yeah. I mean, you, you kind of can. Maybe we'll get into that later. Yeah. Um, but you cannot really argue with success. If you get feedback, positive feedback from subscribers um, that are a part of an email list that your agency or, or workplace owns, and all of a sudden there's a shift in their behavior, shift for the better, Go going back to the same old ways yeah. would be insanity as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> so I would say just suggest to test it out. Try it out. Worst case, it will not work. Mm -hmm. um, but in the best case scenario, you're opening a door to a wonderful, wonderful journey. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's fantastic. I was going to say, I'm curious as you've worked with your clients, like what are some positive implications of starting to kind of employ or deploy these ethical marketing practices? Because, you know, in an age where all of our inboxes are overflowing, at least mine is, I don't know about all of you, some people are much more disciplined at email than I am. How can ethical marketing and email practices, one, help us stand out, but then also have you, how have you seen it make clients more successful in what they're trying to do? Yeah, no, absolutely. I can tell you that the clients that I'm working with, the, their stats, um, and I'm talking across the board, open rates, click-through rates, conversion rates, the whole shebang are higher than any industry benchmark, period. Um, I just finished working with a client. Her uh, email newsletter, her weekly ones got something between 5 to 7% click-through rate, which is twice, if not triple, the, the amount of click-through rate or the number uh, in the industry benchmark. Mm -hmm. um, 
people are getting more replies. Now, replies, I always say, is one of the hardest thing yeah. to get from your subscribers. Uh -huh. Clients of mine tell me, you know what, I'm getting so much replies and, and people are so kind to me. And it's so fascinating to hear what they have to say. Yeah. Um, so it's those little wins. I'm not even talking about money wins because those are obviously yeah. happening as well. Uh -huh. But it's the conversations. All of a sudden, my clients have a deeper they have deeper, more meaningful conversations with people mm -hmm. sometime, you know, across the country, across yeah. the world. Um, and I see the shift in their energy, mm -hmm. the excitement, mm -hmm. the, you know, the spark in their eyes when I'm talking to them. You know, like I, I just talked with, with a subscriber of mine in whichever state or whichever country. It's thrilling. Yeah. It's really thrilling because it's really deeply personal. Yeah. Um, so it works and it's magical. Really. That's so great. I mean, I, I mean, to me, I'm like, well, it just makes sense. But, you know, there's people somehow, some way that are still baffled by, you know, the idea of acting and behaving ethically after, you know, being rewarding. I think because it's more of the long game than the short game is one. Absolutely. Um, right. And, and then another is it's funny because I was when we were talking about email yesterday, um, with a fellow member of Together Digital, she was like, do you ever get replies on your emails? I was like, well, yeah, no, not really. Like, I don't, mm. I mean, if we do, it's because something went amiss or something wasn't working. It's not like, mm. oh my gosh, I really enjoyed this and found this helpful. You know, it's not one of those things where it's like the dialogue is starting kind of a thing. Like you said, creating more meaningful uh, connections and conversations, making it less of a monologue, more of a dialogue. So I think that's a really great success indicator that not a lot of people would think of or consider. Um, but I have definitely been that person where, and I've had her on a, as a guest, a partner, Ray, she owns a DEI organization called moving beyond. And she came back on to be a guest for our podcast a second time because of something, a story she shared in her email. Um, and I felt like it was a really awesome, relevant and timely topic. And I was like, you have to come back and speak on this, you know? <laughs> so I've even been that person that replies to an email blast. So yeah, it can happen folks. <laughs> you, you have to train your subscribers and you have to ask for it, but yeah, it can happen. Yeah, totally. All right. What are, um, actually, before we move on to the next question, Kristen, our, from our live listening audience had a question as well. She was curious, um, because we were on the subject of testing as you're trying to advocate for putting more ethical practices into place. Is there such a thing as too small of a distribution list for testing? I, I wouldn't say so necessarily, because what you've got is what you've got, right? I mean, even if you have 10 people on your list. Those are still 10 individual people who trusted you enough to provide you with their email addresses and whichever other zero party data that they provided to you. Um, you still have to cater to those people. Um, if we're talking about this one-on-one -on -one connection, start with whatever you have. Obviously, the more data you have, you, the more subscribers you have, the better, you know, and the more, hopefully the more accurate um, and less risky the yeah. testing will be. Mm -hmm. um, but we have to remember the subscribers on the other end, they don't know and they don't care how many other people are on the list. The size really doesn't matter. Um, the only thing that you really need to care about is to cater to each and every individual on your list as the individuals that they are. Oh, well, yeah. Yeah. That's a good, good point. I love it. That's a great answer. Awesome. Um, if any of you have any follow-up questions or anything, let us know. Um, I'm going to ask one more question and then we're going to come back um, to Devon's question. What are some great examples of companies who are embracing ethical marketing? So we can go either check out their email list or sign up for it. So we can start to see more of this in practice and out in the world. So I think it'll help us, you know, carry it through in our work too. There are a bunch of companies that I really, really like. I'm going to specifically mention a couple of them from the e-com uh, room, just because I think they still have the biggest issues with their uh, email marketing uh, tactics. So one that I really, really love is a company from Australia called Who Gives a Crap. 
I already like the name. <laughs> yeah, they're amazing. So first of all, they're utilizing their tone of voice. Uh, they're really, really strong uh, with anything to do with humor and irony, which mm -hmm. I love. Uh, it really differentiates um, them from the competition. Right. What they're doing basically is uh, subscriptions uh, for toilet paper. <laughs> genius. That's it. Um, and they're they're just brilliant. So their emails are never, I would say, a hard sale. Uh -huh. It's more of a how can we use the user generated user generated data mm -hmm. to actually um, address objections. So, mm -hmm. for example. Um, one thing that they do is the subscription is, I think, 48 rolls mm -hmm. in, in one box, which is. <laughs> Seems like a lot of toilet paper. <laughs> it is a lot of, I wanted to say it's a shit ton of. <laughs> Pun intended. Pun intended. Hey, copywriters. <laughs> uh, um, but one of their latest emails that I've seen uh, to the date of the recording of this is a whole email of what can you do with 48 roles? And, yeah. and it was fabulous because it was funny, it was creative, and it was addressing objections from either repeating clients mm -hmm. or new ones. So I thought that was fabulous. And they're doing a lot of great things. Um, another one that I really like is um, called Nude, N-U-U-D. Um, it's a, some kind of an ecological uh, deodorant that you just put once every who knows when. Um, you apply it and then you go dancing. So taking that theme of, you know, it protects you, whatever you do. Uh, a few months ago in summer, they actually sent a curated playlist uh -huh. uh, to their subscribers because that's a part of their premise, right? You're, yeah. you're never going to sweat again or something. Uh -huh. I'm, I'm making this up, uh, okay. but you're, it, it's not going to show. You're going to be covered. You're going to be protected. So you can play this playlist. You can start dancing like crazy and you would still be protected. So I love that. So basically it's yet again, catering to your subscribers mm -hmm. with your own value proposition Right. But doing that in really creative and personal ways. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Those are two great examples. And Julie shared with us the, the websites in the link as well. That's so awesome. All right. Uh, Devon wanted to ask, do you consider incentives unethical more from a value exchange versus just transactional? Recently achieved great results for an email survey that incorporated a survey that would help uh, product improvement. Mm. I always say it's not the what, but the how. So for example, for the longest time, and I was very publicly loud about this on LinkedIn, um, I said wherever I was, you know, I hate lead magnets, which is a term and a definition that I despise completely up, up until now. And then I realized that the, the problem was not what it is. Um, if you want to provide value, real value, do that. If that's your way to bring people in and the right people, they will stay and, you know, they'll be there. Mm -hmm. Worst case scenario, they'll just download your freebie or whatnot and unsubscribe later. And that's okay. They, okay. So they got the value from you. Mm -hmm. Great. Awesome. And they escorted themselves out of your list. Right. Win-win situation for everyone, right? Um, so incentives as a concept, and I say the same thing about sponsors, for mm -hmm. example, uh, on email lists. As a concept, it's not a bad concept. Sure. But it's what you provide to your subscriber and how does that benefit to your subscriber? Mm -hmm. um, because if you want to give an incentive to get feedback, and you actually got the feedback and everyone's happy. Amazing. Yeah. If um, I had another example and just yeah, flew by. <laughs> um, so 
that's great. But if you want to have a lead magnet for the sake of a lead magnet, and then you just add some kind of a checklist that no one really uses or cares yeah. about. Yeah. You're, you're missing out on a really good opportunity in my, in my opinion, or if you're bringing on a sponsor onto your email list mm -hmm. as a concept, not a bad idea whatsoever, but how does that serve your subscribers and why, mm -hmm. why would this person, why would you uh, share some kind of an affiliate link to someone else yeah. if that's not going to benefit your subscriber? Mm -hmm. So yeah. Again, as a concept, great. It's a matter of how and why. Getting it valuable. That's so, yeah, I love it. Hopefully that answered uh, the questions. Thank you so much from the live listening audience for asking. We've got a few minutes left for more. If anybody either wants to come off of mute or um, type anything else into the chat. This has been super awesome, Yuval. Like I said, I'm just in this space right now of thinking about email. So I'm excited to keep talking with you about it. You're going to be getting and seeing a lot of our emails. So you can just be emailing me, <laughs> Amy, what the hell? <laughs> <laughs> and me and we will work on it. But yeah, um, this was super great. I love the pillars. I loved the guidance. The examples were all fantastic. Um, oh, here we go. Julie wants to know what email marketing platform do you use and or prefer? Um, do you mean uh, the the platform that I send emails through? Distribution. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm currently using Active Campaign. Okay. I'm getting this um, question a lot. Mm -hmm. um, there is no such thing as the perfect email service provider. It's oh, how yeah. you use it. <laughs> Yeah, because, yeah. for example, there's a standard right now in the e-com world that Clavio is the number one uh, email service provider for mm -hmm. that. I would agree, but <laughs> if you don't know how to use it, you're going to yeah. be frustrated either way, even if it's the best one, the best yeah. ESP in the world. So it doesn't matter. It's about how you use it. Um, Great point. Yeah. Yeah. That's such a great point. I feel that way about a lot of our technology and platforms. Sometimes it's like, oh, we've got like this Cadillac of a, you know, our super premium type of tool. But if you only use 10% of it, you're, you're paying a lot for something you're not getting a lot of use out of. So that is also a fantastic point and could be a whole nother conversation. <laughs> but thank you, Julia. It was a great question. All right. Anybody else have any other questions before we wrap it up for the day? All right. Make sure that you follow you all on LinkedIn. Um, the link is included in the chat. Will also be included in the show notes. Subscribe to Yaval's email list. Next week, our Power Lounge is going to be a really interesting conversation. We're going to be talking about human giver syndrome and boundaries. So these last two like weeks have been talking a lot about showing up and creating interaction over interruption, which dovetailed so nicely into your conversation today. You have all a more deeper level from an email marketing standpoint. Uh, but next week, as we get in, as we encroach upon the multitude of holiday seasons that we've been celebrations we have going on this time of year, we're going to talk about human giver syndrome. Oh, we have one more question for you. And we've got time. Let's make sure we ask it. Yes. Personalization for a large corporations. How do you recommend a large company approach personalization with hundreds or millions of emails? I get it. I have that problem too. I'm just kidding. I don't. <laughs> That's mm -hmm. a great question. <laughs> I guess it really depends. Oh, I'm, I'm surprised I didn't say that beforehand because my mantra is it depends. Um, but it really depends what your what kind of personalization you want to incorporate and and why. So, for example, I think that a huge part of personalization is using your subscriber's first name, which a lot of those companies that have millions of subscribers are not using. Wow. I think it's a missed opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, I think the first thing that you need to uh, deploy is basically having this uh, first name, at least first name uh, field for every new subscriber to, you know, um, type when they get in, into your list. Um, so that's one. I think, yeah, exactly. Names, proper, proper pronouns. Um, yeah. I even go as much as, you know, to ask, where do you hear about my list? Um, that's something, speaking of lead magnets, ugh, again, terrible uh, definition. Um, when you 
subscribe to my email list nowadays, you do receive a mini course, free mini course, three parts of how to set an exceptional onboarding experience that serves both your company and your subscribers in the short term and in the long term. Um, so it's about setting this onboarding experience. Um, and then personalization could be so many different things. It starts with names and proper pronouns, obviously. But then it could be, could be as we mentioned before, something like, I don't want to receive notifications about this upcoming launch, or I don't want to register to the upcoming webinar. So don't bother me with it. Um, the world of personalization, I think we're just scratching the surface of it now. Um, so it's about being creative and really asking for feedback, constant feedback from your subscribers because they really know best. Um, if you don't have feedback, you don't know what you won't know what to do in terms of personalization. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter if you have a hundred people on your list or two million. So true. So true. Oh my gosh. I'm writing down notes here because you're giving me so many ideas. I'm really excited <laughs> <laughs> to start playing with and customizing. Yeah. Cause I mean, I mean, as somebody like us, we have a lot of different offerings as an organization. Um, and so, but you know, majority of our members and community kind of gravitate towards one or two of those elements or items they have with their peer group, or they have, they like the events only, or they like to hear and see thought leadership. And sometimes it's like, you know, they like the Slack community. Sometimes it's just one, sometimes it's two of those, yet we're always kind of hitting them up with all of the information. Mm. Um, and that goes the same for even potential members. So yeah, I think that there's just so much opportunity to create some cool segmenting to make sure that when we are sending out messaging, we aren't getting a number of unsubscribes because we're just giving everybody everything. We're cramming everything down everyone's throat when that might not be their preference. I'd rather keep them as a subscriber and have them hear what they want to hear versus mm -hmm. listen to everything we have to say. <laughs> and then well, listen. I have a suggestion for you right yeah. at the top of my head. Uh, yeah. My head. Um, how about just in your welcome sequence, if you have one, I can't remember. We do. We do. Um, yeah. Then just incorporate one of the first uh, emails in, in one of the first emails, just send people to their preference. Um, what is it? Like a System? preference center. So yeah, preference center, center, center where they can choose. Yep. Exactly. That's great. And then you have transparency, you have consent. Mm -hmm. You don't have storytelling, but it will lead to better storytelling. <laughs> Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And then it's a win-win situation for everyone. Right? A hundred percent. Well, this has been fabulous. I'm going to scroll one more time, make sure there are no more questions. This has been so great. Thank you so much again for sharing your story. Just, I mean, it's, it's so clear that you are doing like the thing you were meant to do and you are so good at it and you're passionate about it, but also <laughs> so knowledgeable. And I just love that you have chosen your point of view about ethical email marketing and have stuck to it. I think that in itself too, just shows a lot about how brilliant you are. So thanks for joining us today, Yuval. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, and thanks to our live listening audience. I appreciate your questions. I appreciate you listening. Um, I hope you enjoyed this week's talk and I hope to see you all next week. Until then, keep asking, giving and growing y'all have a good weekend. Bye everybody.